is it just me or do all alocasia leaves look like alien heads? I don't know why, plant friend, but every time I look at an alocasia, it feels like there are these little aliens looking at me, smiling back at me. I don't know if it's the veining. I don't know if it's the interesting arrowhead shape of their leaves, or maybe it's the fact that they have these skinny little stems that these enormous leaves sit on and they're just like, oh, I'm an alien. Will you love me? Well, you love me, but I'm a difficult diva. This is a difficult diva alien, and I am here to help you stop killing them and help them thrive in your home. Growing joy. I have in my possession my dream plant. This plant has lived in my head rent-free for so long. I cannot believe I'm the proud owner of it. I am so ready to do what it takes to make this thing thrive. And I will be revealing it to you at the end of the video, so stay tuned. Welcome to Growing Joy with Maria. I am Maria, your new best plant friend. I am here to help you care for plants and cultivate joy. Today, we are doing a deep dive on, I think, the genus of plants that I have pined over the most. I have so many of these plants pinned on my Pinterest board, saved in my Instagram stories. I am obsessed with alocasia. But let me tell you, plant friend, in my time, I've killed a lot of alocasia, and I am here making this video for you, making sure that you can learn from all of my mistakes and successfully have these little aliens thriving in your home. So today's episode, made in partnership with Proven Winners, Leaf Joy, all these amazing alocasia are from them, is celebrating the sexy, the elusive, the kind of freaky alocasia and everything you need to know to care for them. Alocasia. Sometimes they're called elephant ears. Sometimes they're called freaky alien plants, the way I like to refer to them. These are pretty famous for being probably some of the hardest houseplants to take care of, but I'm going to argue that yes, they're definitely a 2.0 plant for the plant parent. They're not necessarily a beginner plant for a beginner plant parent, but I'm going to argue that if you have the right conditions, alocasia can easily thrive in your home. It's that a lot of people bring alocasia home and they don't have the conditions for them and they don't alter their environment so that their alocasia can thrive, that's when you bring an alocasia home and then you have that moment of the leaf curl, of the leaf drop, and it's like, you know, all your dreams slipping through your fingers. So like I said, I've killed a lot of plants. I've learned a lot in the process. So let's dive in. When we look at plant genus, I think it's really important to think about where do these plants live and thrive? Because really, as a plant parent, it's up to us to kind of figure that out, figure out where they live outdoors and replicate that environment to the best of our ability. So these pretty guys, they live in the rainforest. They live on the ground in the rainforest, right? They can be found in Southeast Asia, in New Guinea, in some parts of Australia, and they're living in the understory, in the understory of the rainforest. So let's think about that for a minute. I'm in the rainforest. I'm in the understory. They kind of spread across the bottom, right? It's humid. It's probably 80% humidity there, if, you know, maybe even higher. Um, that that soil is going to be pretty consistently moist. The, the bottom of the rainforest doesn't really dry out. And it's getting dappled light. Because it's at the bottom of the rainforest, it's not really getting direct sun exposure. It's getting gentle, dappled light. And actually, it's thought that sometimes alocasia and also calathea, if you see them having purple undersides um, or darker, that is actually an adaptation of the alocasia to be able to receive more light, to be able to capture more light. It's also often why their leaves are so large. Because if you're in the rainforest in the understory and you're trying to get every single piece of light that you can get from the forest canopy, you have to adapt and have large leaves so you can capture as much as possible. I live in upstate New York in the woods. I get four seasons. I get winter, something snow, something that, you know, these plants have never seen in a tropical rainforest. And also because of forced air, because of heating and because of the nature of where I live, it's sometimes as low as 14% humidity in my house. So if I was to take these plants home and not do, not make any alterations in my home, they would like shrivel and die pretty quickly. But no fear. As a plant parent, there are a lot of simple things that you can do to help these guys thrive. So let's dive right in. Lighting for alocasia. Now here's something I love about alocasia. They don't need high light. So they're not fighting, you know, we all only have so much high light windowsills in our homes, right? And it's kind of like a fight for which plant gets that, that big access to the sun. Alocasia don't want direct light on their leaves. They can actually burn. If you think about it, once again, they're getting that dappled light on the, in the understory of the rainforest. So these plants, 
need bright indirect light. Now, light is subjective. Everybody's light is going to be completely different based on if you're in an apartment, in a home, what direction your windows face, right? If maybe you have a big window, but you've got a big building in front of you, so it's blocking the sun. If you struggle with this, I have a free download called Understanding Natural Light that's available to download in the show notes. Um, it takes you through three days of understanding how to kind of diagnose your indoor lighting environment. But just trust that I'm going to talk in this video trusting that you already know that they're going to need bright indirect light. You can put them a couple of feet away from a window. So these are really beautiful statement plants. I mean, look at this alocasia stingray, right? This plant can stand on its own. These leaves are unlike anything I've ever seen before. Look at this alocasia long, long galoba. I mean, come on, come on with those leaves. You could put this in the middle of a coffee table, right? And the beauty of this bright indirect light, if you've got you know, a big window, but you have your coffee table a few feet away from that big window, an alocasia would be perfect for that. And you can just put this one plant in the middle of your coffee table and let it be a perfect statement piece. But anyway, when it comes to light, Make sure that you're not burning your plants. Make sure that they're not getting too much direct light exposure. And many of the alocasia can tolerate low light. Just remember, low light doesn't mean no light, okay? If you have a room with no windows, that's not a low light area. That's a no light area. So make sure that your plant is getting light because these green pieces in this plant, the chloroform, that's where the plant makes its food. Plants need light in order to make its food to survive. All right, let's talk about moisture. Probably next to humidity, so maybe the number two thing that sometimes people get wrong with alocasia. These plants love moist soil. They don't like wet feet, but they love moist soil. They do not like to get dried out. Most alocasia, you're going to keep the soil relatively moist at all times. You can let the top, I like to measure by knuckles, so like maybe the top knuckle can dry out, um, but you're never going to want to let a pot dry out completely. If you struggle with understanding moisture, there's a couple of ideas that I have for you to learn. Number one, moisture meters. So if you've never seen one of these before, it's a moisture meter and it basically measures how much water is in the soil. So the way that it works is you'll put a moisture meter in the soil like this, and the beauty of this is a pot like this has a lot of soil in it that goes all the way deep down. You can put your finger on the top of the soil and it might feel dry, but a few more inches down, it still might be pretty moist. So you put the moisture meter in the soil and this might be able to help you. I personally don't use these anymore, but when I was getting started as a plant parent, it was really helpful. I remember like running from plant to plant, kind of sticking it in and, and getting a day-to-day -day measurement because sometimes people are scared to overwater. If you're prone to overwatering, these are a great tool. Another way to kind of measure soil moisture and this comes over time picking up your pot right so as you get to know your plant when you're watering it after it's done draining pick the plant up and feel how heavy the soil feels when it's moist then throughout the week, throughout a couple of weeks as you're walking around, you can pick the plant up and then you can start to feel when the soil has gotten dry because the pot is going to be so much lighter. Between the moisture meter, the pickup method, and then using your finger the good old fashioned way, sticking your finger in the soil, rubbing it in between your fingers and feeling if it's moist, if it's dry, moist soil, moist potting mix also tends to feel cooler. Dry potting mix tends to feel warmer. And I really encourage you, you know, I wrote a self-help book about using plants to live a more mindful life. Take measuring soil moisture as a mindful moment. So there's two different ways that I can measure the moisture of the soil. I could jab my finger in, pull it out, feel what I need to feel and move on with my life. Or I could make it a mindful moment. I could take a deep breath. I could gently put my finger in the soil. I could kind of rub the soil between my fingers. I could try and engage as many senses as possible. Maybe you want to smell it. Maybe you want to see it. You know, soil is darker when it's moist and lighter in color when it's dry. How many of your senses can you engage in this mindful moment? Because that's why we're caring for plants, right? To cultivate joy. And if you're a mindful plant parent, I have a ton of different plant parent personalities on my website. You can take the free test on my website if you're curious about what your plant parent personality is. Is the mindful plant parent alocasia is such a great plant for the mindful plant parent because the mindful plant parent is someone who wants to engage with their plants every day they want to use their plants as a self-care tool right and so plants that are more moisture loving like the alocasia that need more moisture in their soil they're going to need more watering they're going to need you to kind of tend to their leaves to make sure their big leaves are clean so that they can photosynthesize these are great plants for for people that really want to invest time invest time with their plants and grow some joy with them all right let's talk about pots and alocasia because I 
I have learned the hard way from some of this. So like I said, alocasia like a pretty evenly moist soil. So don't put them in terracotta, right? Terracotta, a very porous material, breathes. It's going to dry out a lot faster. So I have a couple of options of pots that I wanted to suggest for those of you who are going to go on your alocasia journeys. I love how this stingray is like about to sting me in my face. Let me just, can I move you a little bit? Okay, cool. There's three different types of pots that I like for alocasia. Number one is glazed. This is a little guy for demonstration, but you know, the ceramic glazed pots, unlike terracotta, this isn't going to breathe. It's not going to wick the moisture out of the soil as fast. So it's going to allow for the moisture to stay in the soil instead of go into the air. I also love plastic pots for alocasia for the same reason. The plastic is going to hold the moisture in the soil. I love this pot. It's called the Wally Grow Loop. It's made from recycled plastic, which I also love, but it's actually a two-in-one, a cash po in, in a container. You can kind of also use this as a self-watering system. So this is also a self-watering pot, but I love that I feel like my plants that are in my Wally Grow Loops, I, I don't have to water as much, which is really helpful. And so with alocasia, where you want the soil to, to stay moist, I think this is a great option. You water it in here, you can let it drip out in your, in your faucet, or you can kind of let it drip out in the bottom of the reservoir and then there'll be a little bit of evaporation. It'll be great. I wanted to introduce you to the self-watering pot. Now, this is how the self-watering pot works. It's pretty cool. Um, capillary action and a rope. It's very simple. You could make your own self-watering pot or you could buy a fancy one like this that I bought off of Amazon, which I think is super chic. But basically you have a reservoir of water in the bottom. There's a rope, a cotton rope that's connected. And then when you pot up your alocasia, you're gonna pot the rope in here. And what happens is the water wicks up the wick and then releases some water into the soil on a daily basis as much as it needs. Note with self-watering planters, and this has been a problem with me in the past, your self-watering planter reservoir refill routine is going to be totally different than your watering routine because obviously it's going to take a lot longer for this to get dry. So sometimes with my self-watering planters, I've completely forgotten about them and I've let the reservoir dry out and then you're just not watering your plant, right? Because you're trying to let the capillary action do its thing. So just be mindful. If you're going to use a self-watering planter system, like set a timer or remember to check that water reservoir because you can't let it dry out. Because once again, that's really where you're going to have a lot of unhappy alocasia. Okay, I'm going to get rid of these pots and I'm going to introduce you to a very important part of my plant collection, my wedding vase. I bought this the day after my wedding. Um, it's a big joke between me and my husband. But what I have found with alocasia, you'll understand Understand this in a minute. First, let's talk about humidity. If you want alocasia to thrive in your home, humidity is going to be the answer. Where a lot of people struggle is not having enough humidity. These allocation need it. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can have humidity in your house if you can't afford like a full house, you know, humidifying system, right? Um, but there are also some ways that I see advised on the internet that I wouldn't advise for you to do. Humidity. You need to raise the humidity around the plant a significant amount. Misting the air or misting your plant leaves is not going to do the trick for you. Number one, when you mist plant leaves, these leaves are huge. And if water sits on the leaves, that's going to allow for potential fungal infection. I do not recommend misting the air or misting leaves to increase humidity. If you misted the air around the plant, technically you would increase the humidity for a small amount of time, but that is not going to increase the humidity all day long, which is what your allocation need. So unless you are planning on sitting next to your pretty little alocasia all day and just spritzing the air, I don't know if that's your best option. A better option, which I have recently forayed into, is growing under glass. Basically, you can put specimen plants under glass in a variety of different ways. You've probably seen the IKEA greenhouse. You've probably seen people put greenhouses or little pop-up tents, you know, in their homes for their prized plants. But basically, you're creating a humid environment in a smaller area that's easier to increase the humidity in order to have your plants grow successfully. So this is my wedding vase. I bought this the day after I got married. My husband was like, what are you doing? You're crazy. And I could not handle. You can find these things at thrift stores so easily and they're so affordable. And what I love is it's so large that you can put a pretty good sized alocasia in it. So I would pick my prized alocasia, which I'm going to show you at the end of the video. But for the purpose of this video right now, let's talk about this alocasia poly, right? One of my first alocasias that I ever cared for. Basically what you do, maybe I'll put some leca in the bottom, but I'll just put this plant in my wedding vase 
you can pretty it up. You can choose a different, you know, you can choose a different pot. You can style this as much as you want or not. And now we're growing under glass. As the plant transpires, it captures some humidity. And this, if you put a hygrometer in here and you watch the, the humidity increase, you're going to be able to make a really comfortable environment for your plant. You don't want mold to grow in your plants. There are a lot of these varieties that you can buy with holes in the top, which will allow for some ventilation. But if you're going to grow in something like this that you thrift, I would highly suggest once a day, once every couple of days, burping your plants. So I'll take this off for like an hour. I'll let some air flow through and then I'll put it back on. But I think this is a really fun way to grow higher humidity loving plants when you can't just humidify your whole house. I'm a renter. I live in the woods. It's 14% humidity in my house. I cannot increase the humidity of my entire house. So this is a great solution for that. Now what I'm going to tell you, plant friends, I'm sorry to break it to you, but going the humidifier route is definitely going to be the easiest way. The way that I've solved this for myself is that I have one room in my house that I have humidifiers running in. So I don't have to worry about the loft where like the humidity is going to escape to. I have one section of my house that I humidify on a daily basis, and that's where I'm going to put all of these alocasia. That's where I'm going to put my high humidity loving plants. It's also where my bird Frankie lives, and I treat Frankie better than I treat my or my plants and in the winter when I saw Frankie scratching his little birdie legs because the skin was getting dry I was like okay we're doing this we're humidifying the whole place I highly suggest doing some sort of humidity amplification system if you can alocasia really want to be living at between like 50 and 80 percent humidity and unless you're living in some sort of subtropical area if you have any form of forced air whether it's heat or air conditioning those forced air machines will suck the humidity out of your environment so just put a little bit of humidity in and frankly my plant friend it's good for your plants and it's good for you and it's good for your skin one more thing about humidity and watering that I'm I'm going to recommend for you. I, once a quarter with all my plants, but particularly plants that have really large leaves like alocasia, like monstera, some of my calathea, like big leaved plants, these leaves are vectors for dust. And it is really hard to wipe them down. I will say I recently have found these microfiber gloves. Um, I think this company is called We The Wild. I'll, I'll link them below. You can also get pairs on Amazon. You can go through with gloves and wipe off your plants, right? With either neem oil or just by themselves to make sure that you're getting all the dust off of your plants. But if you're lazy like me, and that doesn't sound super exciting to you all the time, you can give your plants a shower. So once a quarter-ish, I'll put my plants in the shower and I'll run the water over, just like a tropical rainstorm, right? And that allows water to trickle over. It's also good for pest prevention in case there are any like little pest eggies like hiding, hiding from you. Um, but also that water will kind of drip down the leaves and pull any dust or weird particles. Once again, I've talked about forced air a bunch, but these plants are living in an environment in our home that is nothing like the way they live outside. You know, indoors, there's all sorts of stuff being put through our vents, dust getting thrown up. I would say give your plants a shower once a quarter if you can. Next is fertilizer. A lot of people wonder when to fertilize alocasia. Rule of thumb with most fertilizing of houseplants is that you're going to fertilize in the growing season. And for houseplants and most plants, the growing season is spring, summer, and sometimes fall. I push back here because a lot of our plants are growing under grow lights. A lot of them aren't experiencing the four seasons in the capacity that they would outdoors. So sometimes our plants don't necessarily grow in the spring, right? If you're growing an alocasia under a grow light, it might be growing in the winter. My rule of thumb with houseplants and fertilization is if you see new growth on your plant, support that plant with some fertilizer. Feed it when it's growing. And if you notice that it goes into a bit of dormancy, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that's when you might want to peel off the fertilization because your plant doesn't really need it. Let's talk about dormancy. I get a lot of questions about this. Do alocasia go dormant? What do I do if my alocasia drop all of my leaves? If your plants are indoors, they shouldn't be going fully dormant. What I would say is your plants might experience in the winter because of lack of light, right? So our plants are going to notice how long our day lengths are. So when our day lengths get shorter, if they're not under grow lights, they might go through what I call, actually, I don't call it this, like plant scientists call it this, a quiescence, a quieting. It's when the plants just get a little quiet, they get a little sleepy, they don't go fully dormant like a tree does and lose all of its leaves, but they're going to pull back. So in the winter or when your days are getting shorter, it might 
be normal for your alocasia to maybe lose a couple of bottom leaves. That's totally normal. Don't freak out. Just know that it's going a little quiet. It's experiencing a quiescence and it's going to wake back up whenever it's ready to wake back up and start growing for you again. And one thing about quiescence if your plant is experiencing some quiescence, if your plant is slowing down, is going sleepy a little bit, maybe that's an invitation for you to experience a little bit of quiet in your life. Maybe look at your plant and see how you can mimic it and experience a little bit of quiescence in your life. What area of your life can you let get a little bit of quiet and maybe prepare for another season of growth. Let's talk troubleshooting. I get questions about leaf drop and alocasia. So if you have an alocasia maybe that only has a couple of leaves and it puts off another leaf, but then it drops the lower leaves, right? That's probably a sign that it's not getting enough light. So it's like only keeping the amount of leaves that it can sustain for itself. If your alocasia aren't growing as big and bushy as you want them to, I would say try putting them under a little bit more light. In general, I find that people overestimate the amount of light that they have in their homes. So I'm always going to encourage you to go a little bit more towards more light than less light. That's why I'm very hesitant to say that a plant is low light because then I feel like people put them in too low of a lighting condition and then they're sad. Speaking of being sad, if the plants droop, it might be turgidity with the water. So I would say if you have a very droopy alocasia, think about it. These, li these tiny little stems have to hold up these big leaves. So try maybe experimenting with giving it more water because the water is what keeps the stems turgid. Um, it also might be a lighting thing. It also might be a fertilization thing. That's the thing. There's a lot of, you know, with troubleshooting, it's hard to give a blanket, you know, remedy because it's all dependent on your environment and your plant and all of those good things. I've also seen a lot that alocasia become vector for spider mites. I know that this is something that a lot of people say. I believe it. I would say be careful. Look for spider mites. Check the nook of the leaf where the leaf and the stem conjoin. Make sure that you're checking to see if there are any spider webs. That's a big sign that you have spider mites. But if you set your alocasia up for success, if you put them in high humidity, if you let the soil stay moist and only just have it the top centimeter dry out, if you speak kindly to it, if you give it everything it needs, it's probably not going to get spider mites as much as a plant that was suffering would, right? Because when plants are unhappy, that's when they really get opened up to a lot of pest infestation. So I would say do your your best to have them thrive. And also plant pests are part of life. I have a whole episode on how to treat every type of plant pest you need on the Growing Joy with Plants podcast if you need that. Okay, I am so excited to introduce you to my new favorite plant that I will be introducing at the end of the video, but I also want to introduce you to all of these different species and give you a few tips. Before that, I want to say a quick thanks to today's sponsor, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. Plant friends, I just got back from the Proven Winners Leaf Joy greenhouse. Oh my God. They are knocking the houseplant game out of the park. They have this fancy schmancy European greenhouse. They are cultivating only the best varieties of the specific species that we all want. And they're cultivating really interesting species, species that I have not seen on the market. Such high quality. All the plants are super robust. I'm pretty obsessed and I'm pretty thankful that we're partnering on this video. The other thing that I love about Proven Winners is their leaf tags. Um, these tags, they have care information, which is so great because we've all been to the garden center before where we've just gotten a little tag and had no idea what the plant was or not even have a tag, but they also put the plant Latin on it. I just really appreciate that because you know how important knowing the Latin for each plant is for me. Next time you are at the garden center, look for this tag. Look for the Proven Winners Leaf Joy tag. Let me know in the comments of this video what plant you bring home. All right, are you ready for the alocasia tour? Let's get started with the jewel alocasia. So something I learned is there's jewel alocasia and then regular alocasia. The jewel alocasia are the smaller alocasia. Like they're supposed to fit in a little dainty little jewel box, right? So I wanted to introduce you to the alocasia ninja, alocasia reginula, the plant Latin. I love this plant. To me, this is like a very standard alocasia with the deep green leaves, the beautiful white veins. I think it's so striking. And it's really, it's a nice compact plant. I'm excited for the leaves to kind of flatten out a little bit uh, as it grows, but we've already got a lot of new growth. And I just think it's really beautiful. And I also love that the leaves are a little fuzzy. There's like a very special kind of velvety texture to the leaves that is uncommon for many alocasia, which I really love. Okay, the next plant I want to show you is not my ultimate, ultimate favorite plant, but I am falling in love with the alocasia dragon scale. I mean, can we talk about 
the different layers of green in this plant leaf. It is so gorgeous. The other thing I'm falling in love with about this plant is on the other side of the leaves, the veins are purple. It is so cool. The leaves are super glossy. I love the lobes at the top of the leaves. I love how long the leaves are getting. And to me, like, you know, I'm obsessed with alocasias looking like aliens. Like to me, like this is the alien. She's it. She's it. She's everything. I'm really obsessed with her. So I love you so much. Dragon scale. Welcome to my home. Moving right along. Alocasia Watsonia white vein. Okay. Another gorgeous alocasia. Remember when I was talking about the purple undersides of the leaves to help them absorb light? I mean, she's stunning. She's at the moment. She's everything. What's that like viral? <laughs> What's that viral YouTube? But look how big these leaves already are. This is a baby plant. I can't wait for this plant to get huge. These leaves can get so big. I love it so much. But for me, I love the purple backside as much as I like the shiny, sexy green front side. We have a little boob over here. I'm going to put a little tape on it, though, because this leaf is too good to cut off for sure. The alocasia stringray obviously gets its name from the really unique leaves. It has this cool flat classic. The top half is like a classic alocasia leaf. And then it's got this skinny little tail that makes it look like it could go swimming in the ocean. It's so cute. But the other thing that I think is really mesmerizing about this plant is the incredible mottled stems. Um, these stems are purple and white and gorgeous. And I absolutely love them. This is giving me massive under the sea vibes. And I think this is such a statement plant. Like I think I'm going to put this in the center of my coffee table, probably on its own, maybe with a few around it at the bottom. But man, this plant just like stands alone. It's so stunning. I'm so obsessed. Talking about statement plants, we have to talk about the alocasia lon longiloba. longiloba. I like to use the plant Latin. I don't necessarily like to pronounce the plant Latin correctly, but I think it doesn't matter if you use the plant Latin. It's okay. This is like the classic alocasia leaf to me. The alocasia poly is a little bit smaller. This is a very similar, much larger. I mean, look at how large these leaves are. Once again, I just think it's so crazy how they have these skinny stems and these large leaves. It's so glossy and shiny and amazing. It feels so good. Another statement plant, right? Like this plant can hold its own. Just one plant. If you're a minimalist, a big statement alocasia would be like so good and juicy for just like one table or like one statement. I love it so much. I love you. I'm so happy you're joining my, my clan of plants. Thank you. Thank you for being with me. It's time. We've been through all the alocasia. It's time to introduce you to my new favorite plant. Drum roll, please. Here she is. Here she is. The alocasia cuprea. <sighs> She's a dream. She's amazing. I mean, just look at her. Have you ever seen leaves like this? Some people say that this plant looks like it has abs because of the veins. Like, I hear you. I see you. I don't agree. I think it's massive alien energy. B-A-E, big alien energy. That's what I think this plant is. This plant, the leaves are kind of thin. I'm feeling these leaves and these leaves are telling me that she's going to need a lot of humidity. So I believe she's who I'm going to put in my wedding vase. Um, because this has been my dream plant for so long. I have pinned her so many times. I have saved her on so many different Instagram accounts in my saved Instagram. She has new leaves coming in. She has baby leaves. And the plant gets darker and darker as it gets older and older. And actually, the Latin name cuprea, alocasia cuprea, means copper. Cuprea means copper. Um, and it's because it has this kind of like copper-like iridescence, which is just incredible. I am so excited to add all of these alocasia to my collection, but particularly this little lady. Let me know which species is your favorite. Which species is talking to you the most? Have you taken care of alocasia before? What would be other tips that you would give other viewers, right? Like, let's make the comments be a collaborative plant care, plant celebration. Let me know your favorite types of alocasia. Let me know which one you're running to the plant shop to buy. Make sure to look for the Proven Winners tags. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy.